So in our previous session, we discussed individualist approaches to non-anthropocentrism. Remember that anthropocentrism in ethics refers to moral frameworks that only recognize moral value expressed in terms of human interests. So a non-anthropocentric approach to ethics is consciously attempting to undermine this and expand moral consideration beyond our own species. Perhaps humans are the only creatures that can engage in moral reasoning, so all ethics may be anthropogenic in the sense that it comes from humans, but this need not mean that all ethics has to be anthropocentric. The biocentric frameworks discussed by Paul Taylor and Jason Cowall were focused on recognizing the moral value of all living individual organisms, but in that discussion, we noted that this isn't the only possible approach to non-anthropocentrism. Rather than focusing on individuals, we might focus on the whole of the biotic community. For many in conservationist communities, one of the earliest and most influential articulations of this eco-holism comes through Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac particularly in its last essay, The Land Ethic. Leopold opens The Land Ethic with a reference to a scene at the end of Homer's Odyssey, in which Odysseus, still dripping with the blood of the suitors who pursued his wife while he was away at war for ten years, orders his son Telemachus to execute a dozen slave girls suspecting of having slept with these suitors. Not worthy of execution by the sword, the girls are ordered to clean up the dead bodies of the suitors, publicly slut-shamed, and then all hung on a single rope, with Telemachus exclaiming, No clean deaths for the likes of them, by God. Their slaughter is not even worthy of wasting valuable resources or effort on, but rather done in the most efficient way possible. These slave girls were conspicuously not regarded as morally considerable, only as things or property. Thankfully, or maybe more accurately, hopefully, we've made some moral progress since then. This sort of callous disregard for human life still happens, even such that people often employ their ingenuity to find the most efficient means to slaughtering as many humans as they can at once. But such attitudes and actions are now, widely, met with horror, not portrayed as part of a triumphant climax in some piece of popular media. We still, however, regard non-humans in this way as not worthy of moral consideration, where efficiency of slaughter is the primary concern in our dealings with many non-human creatures. So perhaps there's some room, still, for some more moral progress. Leopold frames moral progress as a form of ecological evolution. Leopold explains how this conception of ethics is aiming at the same object as a philosophical approach, noting that an ethic ecologically is a limitation on freedom of action in the struggle for existence. An ethic philosophically is a differentiation of social from antisocial conduct, and these are two definitions of the same thing. That thing has its origin in the tendency of interdependent individuals or groups to evolve modes of cooperation. The ecologist calls these symbioses. Politics and economics are advanced symbioses in which the original free-for-all competition has been replaced in part by a cooperative mechanism with an ethical content. Leopold refers to a definite ethical sequence by which moral progress has been and still can yet be made. The first stage of this sequence, Leopold notes, involves a form of ethics that is primar primarily between individuals. The next phase of development in this sequence is more socially oriented. Now, there seem to be lots of different ways of parsing exactly what that first and second stage are and how we moved from the first to the second stage, uh, but the real thrust of Leopold's argument seems to concern a third stage that we have yet to make. This transition is to a land ethic, one in which our cooperative strategy and moral obligations aren't towards individuals and aren't even towards large human groups, but are towards a larger ecological community. Leopold writes, there is as yet no ethic dealing with man's relation to the land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. Land, like Odysseus's slave girls, is still property. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges, but not obligations. Now, making this transition to the land ethic is perhaps morally incumbent upon us. The important thing, though, that Leopold notes is that this is an evolutionary possibility and an ecological necessity. Leopold regards ethics as a mode of guidance for dealing with ecological situations, and there most definitely is an ecological situation that needs dealing with. 
According to Leopold, ethics has always been ecological in the sense of focused on community, where that community is comprised of a plurality of interdependent individuals. The ethical sequence is simply the expanding of that sense of community in much the way that our focus throughout the semester in this course has been on a stepwise expansion of the moral community. The logical extension, and perhaps the ultimate end of this expansion, points us in the direction of a land ethic where the community in question is a holistic biological community that includes all living things, and even non-living things like soil and water. Everything that plays a role in the holistic community of an ecosystem is part of our community in a land ethic with the land as a shorthand for the whole ecosystem and all of its parts, both living and non-living. That last point is a pretty interesting and controversial one, and perhaps explains why we might not want to call the land ethic a biocentric ethic. Water and soil are as much crucial parts of an ecosystem as living organisms are. The land includes it all. As mentioned already, the land ethic is not the typical attitude amongst humans. Far more common, to the point of near universality, is an anthropocentric ethic in which humans regard the rest of the biotic community as there for human benefit exclusively. In any sort of community, this attitude, where one community member believes themselves to be entitled to exploit the other community members for their own gain, is a problem. Just as a human society where one privileged group views another group as a resource to be exploited is not only wrong, but ultimately unsustainable, a biotic community in which one species is set on bending all of the rest to its own immediate desires will not live for long. In the past few hundred years, through technological innovation and sheer numbers, we have dramatically accelerated our ability to impact the land. Some have even gone so far as to call our current geological period the Anthropocene, unique in the history of the planet thus far in that human activity is now the most significant influence on the planet. But this increase in impact has not been accompanied by the development of an ecological conscience. This ecological conscience is one that aims first and foremost at a harmony between humans and the land. While there had been, even back in 1949 when Leopold was writing this, decades of attempts to teach this ecological conscience, we have always inevitably packaged ecology in terms of anthropocentric interests and even egocentric interests. This isn't a transformation of conscience into a land ethic. It's a bizarre counterfeit that only reasserts the narrowing of moral perspective that the land ethic and the ethical sequence generally must overcome. Those efforts have, perhaps unsurprisingly, been unsuccessful in achieving a harmony between humans and the land because they haven't given any moral consideration to the land itself, only to human interests. The grand irony is that our attempts at ecology through an anthropocentric lens haven't even really been that successful in securing sustainable human benefit, only a bit of relatively short-term profit for a few wealthy landowners. In many ways, we're thrust back into a tragedy of the common style analysis here. Leopold describes an attempts at soil conservation in Wisconsin in the 1930s that mirrors the sorts of issues that Hardin and Ostrom were concerned with. Without some mechanism to compel anything more than short-term self-interest, humans appear to be incapable of sustainably managing the land, even for their own exclusive benefit. We've not significantly improved on this front in the 70 years since Leopold wrote this essay. If anything, we've gotten worse, even as the first signs of catastrophic ecological collapse are unfolding. Without a radical shift in moral perspective, we seem ill-suited for anything but running the land into the ground, no pun intended. And that radical shift can't be packaged in self-serving anthropocentric terms, otherwise it's not a shift at all. It's just business as usual, a slow-motion tragedy unfolding before our eyes. This is what Leopold is talking about when he talks about the A-B cleavage. There is no middle ground between ecological conscience and anthropocentrism, and attempts to frame the land ethic in anthropocentric terms are incoherent. We can't take effective care of human interests unless we fully internalize the need for a harmony between humans and the land. The myopia of the anthropocentric view spoils everything it touches. As Leopold writes, In all of these cleavages, we see repeated the same basic paradoxes. Man the conqueror versus man the biotic citizen. Science the sharpener of his sword versus science at the searchlight on his universe. Land the slave and servant versus land the collective organism. This same cleavage goes for any bastardized pseudo-land ethic that attempts to reduce the value of the land to economic value as well. When we filter everything through the language of dollars and cents, we're just begging to ignore those aspects of ecological health that we can't make a buck on.
At its best, a system of value that inherently depends on what humans are willing to spend money on is incomplete. At worst, it's a grotesque perversion of ecological value. And just as we can't simply outsource this moral transformation of the free market, we can't simply outsource it to government either, leastwise not a democratic government with only human citizens. In a democratic society, the same humans who are incapable of policing themselves are equally incapable of electing representatives that will compel them to do what is uncomfortable, but ecologically necessary. And it certainly doesn't help if that government reduces the interests of the people to economic value, even worse if this is only limited to that which is of economic value to the most wealthy citizens. There's no easy fix for this. What is required is a broad cultural shift in moral perspective to a holistic ecological framework, and this shift needs to transform our character in such a way as to generate deep emotional connections and responsibility to the land. Now, as we'll see shortly, one of the biggest challenges to the land ethic involves some difficulties with regarding the land as a morally significant holistic individual with a good of its own. We've already seen one gesture towards how to think of the good of an ecosystem and the notion that ecological conscience aims towards ecological harmony. So maybe that's a, a lead on what the good of its own for the ecosystem, for the land, might be. Leopold offers a bit of an additional gesture in the form of the land pyramid that gives us a sense of how to think about what it is that ecosystems do and what could possibly count as in an ecosystem's interests. Thinking of the land as the totality of living things, and even some non-living parts of ecosystems like water and soil, etc., is a good start for those of us coming to the land ethic from an individualistic ethical framework. But perhaps a better depiction of the land is as an interconnected system through which energy flows. We can get a pretty good sense of this by way of the notion of food chains. All life begins with light from the sun, which is converted through photosynthesis into starches by plants, which is eaten and converted into proteins by herbivorous and omnivorous animals, and these animals are eaten by other animals, which if they can avoid being killed and eaten by other animals, are ultimately consumed by decomposers and returned to the soil when they die, where they're taken up into new plants and the whole process starts all over again. To quote the British theologian William Ralph Inga, the whole of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat in the active and passive. Ecosystems move energy, or perhaps more accurately, they are the flow of energy throughout the land. The longer and more complex the chains that move this energy, often a function of biodiversity, for example, in an ecosystem, the more robust the land is to stochastic perturbations. The shorter and more one-dimensional these ecosystems, um, as we see in monocultural industrial agriculture, perhaps the dominant point of impact between humans and the land, the more fragile those ecosystems are. Ecosystems can adapt to change, but evolutionary adaptation is relatively slow, particularly when compared with the rate of anthropogenic impacts on the land. Adaptation of the rest of the biotic community can't keep up with the impact of humans, as evidenced by plummeting biodiversity over the past hundred years. In a UN report titled Nature's Dangerous Decline Unprecedented, Species Extinction Rate Accelerating, it's noted that the average abundance of native species in most major land-based habitats has fallen by at least 20%, mostly since 1900. More than 40% of amphibian species, almost 33% of reef-forming corals, and more than a third of all marine mammals are threatened. The picture is less clear for insect species, but available evidence supports a tentative estimate of 10% being threatened. At least 680 vertebrate species have been driven to extinction since the 16th century, and more than 9% of all domesticated breeds of mammals used for food and agriculture had become extinct by 2016, with at least 1,000 more breeds still threatened. This is no surprise to anyone who studies ecology even a little bit. The land pyramid is pyramidal because it represents the differences in populations at different trophic levels of a balanced, stable ecosystem. A balanced ecosystem has lots of producers like plants that turn sunlight into chemical energy. These are at the bottom of the pyramid. So-called apex predators are at the top of the pyramid, as a stable ecosystem can only support a relatively small number of these sorts of organisms. Humans seem to want to have large numbers and also lead an apex predator lifestyle at the same time. This is ecologically unsustainable for any other species. Why would it be any different for humans? The land is globally, according to the overwhelming consensus of those scientists who study it, sick. And this sickness is significantly caused by human activities. 
Now we might take this sickness as a metaphor, perhaps we might take it literally, and that's where things are going to get sticky, as uh, Harley Kane's going to point out. But ultimately, our capacity to manage this incipient catastrophe hinges on whether or not we can make the radical transformation to a land ethic. Either we keep viewing the land as a resource to exploit, or we view it as our community. There's no middle ground between these perspectives. Following so-called enlightened self-interest is the old way, and the old way clearly isn't working given the ecological crises that we're staring down. Whether we're looking at agricultural practices, hunting, forestry, conservation, etc., we must be mindful of this cleavage and not be satisfied with practices that are only justifiable through an egocentric or an anthropocentric lens. Now there's a compelling argument to be made here, and I think Leopold makes that argument very accessible. But the justification that he offers isn't as rigorous as some of the others that we've seen from philosophers that we've read in this course. At the very least, it isn't rigorous in the same way that arguments made by academic philosophers are. Fortunately, J. Baird Callicott is one of the most prolific interpreters of Aldo Leopold and his biggest proponent within the philosophical community. This is at its clearest in his essay, The Conceptual Foundations of the Land Ethic. Callicott notes that despite the enthusiastic embrace Leopold found within the conservationist community, among academic philosophers, he's either been dismissed or ignored. Now that's changed significantly since 1987 when Callicott wrote this essay, in no small part to Callicott's efforts in essays just like this one. But it's fair to say that even now, the land ethic is not widely embraced amongst the philosophical community. And with the exception of some very specific discursive circles, it's regarded by many as still a little bit controversial. The most friendly sorts of criticisms question its conceptual coherence. The most aggressive regard it as dangerous nonsense. However, Callicott contends that a few of Leopold's critics within the philosophical community have properly interpreted him. And this is perhaps understandable for stylistic reasons, since Leopold doesn't really write like most philosophers and has a kind of a poetic, metaphorical style that's sometimes a little bit difficult to pin down interpretively. But I think there's something bigger than that that makes Leopold difficult to interpret, and that's that the land ethic requires a radical shift in perspective at the most fundamental levels of ethical reasoning. Now, relatedly, there are some plausible interpretations of the land ethic that seem to lead to conclusions that challenge some fairly strong and common moral intuitions that we have. The land ethic seems radical because it is radical, and while this doesn't necessarily make it incorrect, it does mean that we might be inclined to interpret it less charitably than we might interpret more familiar ideas. We've got to be able to get past this bias against the unfamiliar if we want to get a clearer picture of what the land ethic is. Callicott draws our attention to the way in which Leopold's land ethic is naturalistic, in a way that steps outside of the usual philosophical perspective to regard moral reasoning as a natural phenomenon. The natural evolution of moral reasoning began, for the most part, theologically, with moral principles grounded by reference to the gods and their commandments to us, though philosophy has busied itself for a few thousand years, grounding the concept of how we ought to act in reason. Perhaps by giving us this shift in focus to human reason, philosophy has given us something that is an improvement, or at least a necessary supplement to theological ethics. But Leopold seems to suggest that both fail to treat moral reasoning as a naturally occurring ecological phenomenon. Perhaps we might think of this phenomenon as biological, or maybe sociological, or anthropological, or psychological, but we might also note that all of these sciences might be also viewed as natural ecological adaptations that allow humans to understand and act in their environments. Morality is, per most ethical naturalists, an adaptation that social beings make in order to live peacefully together. And this has been going on for far longer than philosophical ethics has been operating. As Callicott puts it, we must have become ethical far before we became rational. This perspective is not unprecedented in philosophy, as we can find various formulations that moral obligation is essentially some non-rational, sentimental feeling that might be informed by reason, but isn't reducible to it, and that these feelings are adapted as coping mechanisms for navigating a social environment. Callicott draws our attention to Charles Darwin, who maybe counts as a philosopher, to David Hume, who definitely counts as a philosopher, and Adam Smith, again, who maybe counts as a philosopher. Though in the 17 and 1800s when these guys lived, the distinction between, say, scientist and philosopher or economist and philosopher was pretty blurry. Precedent in the philosophical tradition aside, 
It is worth pointing out that there might be some good reasons to be suspicious of this approach. It risks blurring the is-ought distinction, and has often been used, sometimes under the name of social Darwinism, to justify the oppression of vulnerable groups as survival of the fittest. How could my exploitation of others be wrong if right and wrong are just feelings whose ultimate test is thriving in one's environment? Here I am thriving. Look at my obscene wealth. The justification for my having it is that I was powerful enough, bold enough, and unscrupulous enough to get it. This sort of approach to ethics seems like it runs the risk of being toothless, as Jason Cowell put it, unable to offer any meaningful criticism of immoral behavior. But while there might be good reason to worry that this sort of approach to ethics could be too weak, there's a notable route to a strengthening of moral obligations in the evolutionary recognition that all things are not only our neighbors in the land, but our kin our family. An evolutionary description of ethics seems to identify sentimental empathy and altruism first as familial bonds, with the ethical sequence expanding that sentimental attachment beyond the family to others in our human communities. First, that sentimental attachment is local. But over time, as human communities became less locally isolated and began interacting with one another globally, it's adapted out of necessity for life in a global community to extend that sentimental attachment to include all humans. Furthermore, over time, we've brought many non-humans into our lives and developed sentimental attachments to them as well. As Leopold argues, the next logical step, and possibly, again, the ultimate logical conclusion to this sequence, is to extend it to all the members of the biotic community, and then to the community itself. The natural evolution of morality is to make an ecological turn for any community that has become scientifically aware of ecology and technologically capable of profound ecological impacts. But all of this seems to prescribe the possibility and necessity for the sake of survival in the biotic community of developing empathetic ties to all individual living things, as we saw in the sort of biocentric individualism that Paul Taylor and Jason Cowell were talking about. It seems that we still might have some misgivings about shifting from thinking about morality as obligations to individuals to thinking about it as obligation to a holistic community. As mentioned already, this is what makes the land ethic a different kind of non-anthropocentrism than biocentric individualism, and it's on exactly this point that its justification seems a little bit unsteady. Perhaps we might think of this by analogy to past developments in moral consciousness, like the patriotic identification of the human community itself as a quasi-individual to whom we owe obligations. If you can think that you have obligations to your neighborhood, or to your city, or to your state, or nation, or even to all of humanity, and that these obligations place some limits on any prima facie obligations that you might have to individuals, then why not make the same sort of move to the biotic community? It seems like the development of a patriotic love for one's community and a willingness to sacrifice oneself on its behalf could be evolutionarily advantageous for the members of that community. In this analogy to patriotism, the obvious and familiar sticking point is exactly how we balance obligations to the whole community and obligations to individuals, hence debates in which we invoke individual rights that are intended to restrain governments from unjustly sacrificing unwilling citizens in the name of the greater good. So what level of sacrifice of our own egoistic and or anthropocentric interests is a land ethic actually demanding of us? If we find that this is too demanding, then the land ethic might strain plausibility. And if we find that this is too vague, then perhaps the usefulness of the land ethic might be a little bit compromised. In order to properly evaluate the land ethic, we need some sense of what kinds of actions such an ethical framework would prohibit, what sorts it would permit, and what sorts it would demand as obligatory. Surely the land ethic wouldn't prohibit us from eating, as eating is a necessary condition for life, and it's the paradigmatic way that animals, including human animals, participate in the biotic community. But when we recognize that we must kill to eat, it starts to look as if the land ethic can't really prohibit the killing of other creatures, at least not generally. If we're permitted to kill to eat, and presumably we must be if there's no way to eat without killing something, then what exactly are we prohibited from? Can there possibly be anything resembling a right to life in a community that fundamentally requires the killing and consumption of others? And if we accept that the enormous size of the human population is incompatible with the balance of nature, does this mean that we might not only be permitted, but obligated to kill humans, much like we kill overpopulated species, in the name of ecological balance and harmony? 
If so, it's not difficult to see why some critics suggest that the land ethic is just a little too open to eco-fascism, a political model where governments force citizens to sacrifice their own well-being and even their lives for the sake of the land. This might not have been Leopold's intent, but it might be consistent with his framework. If we have permission to eat, then presumably that means that we have to acknowledge that this requires that we may also be eaten ourselves. Perhaps we might be occasionally thinned out by a pandemic disease. Calicott offers us some good direction in these sorts of problems, noting that the land ethic doesn't replace or override our current moral sensibilities. It augments them. Just as there are some difficult, though not insurmountable, difficulties balancing our patriotic obligations with our obligations to the global human community, there are some difficult, though hopefully not insurmountable, difficulties in squaring our obligations to humans with our obligations to the land. Some of this might simply take the form of some additional obligations and additional constraints on what counts as right behavior. Some of it may demand subtle reconceptualizations of our previous understandings of our obligations. For example, if we're wondering whether the land ethic could be used to advocate for mass genocide out of an obligation to the biotic community, we should probably recognize that there are some handy moral principles that we've already developed through our anthropocentric stage of moral development that would clearly say no. For starters, if one group of people is arbitrarily targeted for extermination for the benefit of other humans, as is typical in genocides, then this violates some basic principles of justice. At best, the decisions about who should be killed must be either based on what seem like objective criteria, say, like uh, some are suggesting for uh, giving younger people preferential medical treatment during a pandemic, which might be ageist, but might just be an attempt at disinterested minimization of harm. Or perhaps those who die ought to be selected at random by a lottery. Either way, these options are clearly more in concert with principles of justice than genocide is. So if we're looking to control the human population, we should prefer that option to genocide. Having made this move, we'll note that surely sterilizing people would also reduce the human population, and it would do so without killing anybody. If killing is a greater harm than sterilization, perhaps assuming that not yet existing future generations don't have any interest in being caused to exist, then forced sterilization is a better option than killing. But even this option violates basic principles of liberty if we're violating people's bodily autonomy for the sake of the land against their will. So voluntary forms of contraception are going to be better than forced sterilization. This might not be as effective, but a full commitment to the sorts of things that both respect human agency and reduce human numbers, like education, career options, and financial independence for young women, effective sex education, and availability of effective contraception, then that should be the preferred course of action. This doesn't sound extreme, or crazy, or even excessively demanding. It certainly doesn't seem like the land ethic commits us to accepting eco-fascism, though it might mean that our actual obligations to take action to reduce the human population might be stronger than we initially think. It might mean that it's immoral to reproduce above replacement rate. It might even mean that it's immoral to reproduce at all. Those sorts of questions seem like they remain to be worked out in discussion, but what's clear from reading Leopold and Calicott is that we can't just shrug off all obligation to do whatever we can to reduce human impacts on the land, or refuse to shoulder any inconveniences or limitations on doing whatever it is that we want to do. While I think that Calicott offers a compelling argument that the land ethic is not committed to, or even consistent with eco-fascism, that question of whether or not a holistic rather than an individualistic sort of non-anthropocentrism is coherent, still seems somewhat unresolved. Harley Cahan points out some significant difficulties with this holistic shift towards the moral considerability of an ecosystem, ultimately concluding that there is no non-arbitrary way to account for a difference in value between one version of an ecosystem and another. You might have come across this sort of argument before if you've ever heard anyone point out that humans don't really pose any real threat to life on Earth altogether. Even the KT extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs only wiped out 75% of life on the planet. We might make the land inhospitable for human life and even lots of other species, but there's still going to be some kind of biotic community no matter what we do. There's still going to be some kind of ecosystem, it'll just be a very different ecosystem from the one that currently exists. 
What would make that ecosystem any worse or better than the currently existing one, or any other ones in the possible futures for the planet? Kayan is pretty clear up front that he shares a pretty basic preservationist intuition with folks like Leopold, in which it seems like ecological conscience is a good thing, and that the preservation or conservation of natural systems is seemingly a good thing to do. The question is whether or not we can justify this intuition, and if so, how. Kayan offers a bunch of options, including that we maybe make an appeal to the interests of individual creatures. We've seen something like that already in uh, individualist biocentrism, but that's not really quite the land ethic. We might make an appeal to human virtue, like we saw Jason Cowell do with his virtue approach to biocentrism, but that too is a, that, that's totally anthropocentric if it's an appeal to human virtue. That's not really the land ethic either. We might make an appeal to the inherent value of natural ecosystems. Um, hold on to that thought, because we're going to come back to that next week. But the line of justification that Cain is most concerned with, and is the crucial one for the land ethic, according to Leopold and Callicott, is by making an appeal to the moral consideration for, or interests of, ecosystems. This is the line of justification that Cain is focused on, and he says that it does not work. Now, it's worth pointing out here that Cain is drawing a necessary connection between something being morally considerable and it having interests. This was a big deal for Paul Taylor, and seemingly for anybody who's a biocentric individualist. We can only hold something morally considerable if we can identify an intrinsic good of its own of that thing. That which we find morally considerable need not be aware of or interested in its interests, but there must be some non-extrinsic standard of differentiating between better and worse states where those interests are or aren't being realized. Kayan argues that if ecosystems don't have interests, then they can't be morally considerable, and they don't have interests, so QED, they aren't morally considerable. But maybe we don't want to take Harley Kayan's word on that. Why shouldn't we suppose that ecosystems have interests? After all, there does seem to be an intuitively meaningful sense of whether or not an ecosystem is healthy or sick. Kayan points out that interests, even in the broadest biocentric understanding of the term, involve goal-directedness. So I suppose that brings us to this question, do ecosystems engage in goal-directed behavior? Now usually we might say that we know goal-directedness when we see it, but this doesn't really offer much help in contested cases, where there are competing intuitions about whether or not some behavior is indeed a goal-directed behavior. We want to avoid sloppy reasoning here, knowing well that we're sometimes prone to metaphorical or anthropomorphic thinking. Saying it's as if an ecosystem is a living thing isn't really quite the same thing as saying that ecosystems are living things. I know that I sometimes treat my car or my laptop as if it has interests, but on just a little bit of reflection, I know this really isn't based on any earnest belief. And there seemingly needs to be some sort of cutoff for moral considerability somewhere. Without a relatively clear standard of goal-directedness as a gatekeeper for what can be morally considerable, there seems to be no limit to what can be morally considerable. Why not talk of the good of its own for a stone, or my laptop, or a table? If moral consideration is going to be meaningful, perhaps it can't apply to everything. There has to be a cutoff somewhere, and if we don't draw it at engages in goal-directed behavior, then it's not clear if we can draw it at all. If I'm open to talking about how a dam frustrates a river's interests in flowing, what's stopping me from talking just as seriously about my table frustrating my computer's interest to fall to the floor? Surely this second case is absurd, right? And we need to make sure that our conception of goal-directedness is capable of discriminating between goals and incidental byproducts. For example, we recently discussed the fact that scores of organisms would probably die if I were to build a patio in my backyard. And while the deaths of these organisms may be a consequence of my actions, it probably isn't my goal. My goal was to build the patio, perhaps in order to satisfy another goal to enjoy sitting in my backyard. Nothing in my activities was aiming towards the deaths of all of those organisms. Not all causation is goal-directed. Having a clearer, more rigorous idea of goal-directedness beyond I'll know it when I see it seems necessary for handling any sorts of contested cases. Unfortunately, this is both complicated and hotly contested philosophical territory. Still, Cain offers us what he takes to be two plausible models for what goal-directedness might entail. The first of these is a behavioristic model that Cain attributes to Ernest Nagel. According to this model, 
A system is goal-directed if it reaches a state by way of behavior that is persistent and plastic. Persistence here is the ability of some system to compensate for interfering factors that would otherwise derail the putative goal. Plasticity here refers to the ability of a system to reach the same goal in multiple ways, and clearly those two conditions are related to one another in some necessary ways. The second model is a more epistemological or explanatory model that Kahn attributes to Charles Taylor, not Paul Taylor, who we read just previously, but a different philosopher, Charles Taylor. On this model, we call some behavior B directed towards a goal G if B reliably brings about G, and also B occurs because it reliably brings about G. Now, both of these models have some issues around the edges, but they seem like decent enough models for a provisional examination of whether or not something should count as goal-directed. Let's take a tree's behavior, for example, as this is something that we might intuitively take to be goal-directed, at least if we're buying into what the biocentrists were selling. Trees grow in some pretty predictable ways, with their roots growing down and the trunks growing up and towards light sources. Is this goal-directed behavior, or is it just an incidental byproduct of some biophysical activities? Well, the tree's growth does seem to be both persistent and plastic. If impeded, the tree can compensate and grow around an obstruction, and can do this because it has multiple routes to what clearly appears to be its goals of getting water and sunlight. And on the second model, it does seem that the trunk growing up and the roots growing down not only reliably bring about the tree getting water and sunlight, but it also seems like a perfectly reasonable explanation to say that it grows in this way precisely because it brings about those results. Now let's consider another example, maybe one where intuitively we want to say that this isn't goal-directed behavior. Like, uh, let's consider the fact that my pen falls when I accidentally knock it off the desk. Is this falling goal-directed behavior on the part of the pen? No. The behavior is not persistent, and it isn't particularly plastic. If I impede the pen from falling, then it's going to stop, not adapt its fall around the obstruction. And even if we said that the pen's falling reliably tends toward it ending up on the floor, it doesn't seem to offer a very good explanation for why the pen falls if we say it fell in order to end up on the floor. So, so far, these models of goal-directedness seem to work fairly well. With the case of the tree where we intuitively thought that that should be goal-directed behavior, it turned out that it was, and in the case of the pen falling where we intuitively thought that that shouldn't count as goal-directed behavior according to our standards that Kane is offering, it doesn't. So now the real question, what about an ecosystem? Does it engage in goal-directed behavior? Well, perhaps we might think that ecosystems behave such that they pursue goals like harmony or balance or stability, or resilience. Ecosystems do seem to tend towards these things, and they might even seem persistent and plastic in those tendings. Ecosystems absorb shocks, and they seek out new equilibria when conditions change. But are these consequences of the actions of the ecosystem, or are they consequences of the actions of individual organisms in the ecosystem? It seems like the latter, and it doesn't seem as if these individual organisms act the way that they do in order to bring about equilibrium or balance in the ecosystem. Harmony, balance, equilibrium, etc. appear to be incidental byproducts of behaviors by individual organisms that are, for the most part, acting towards the goal of their own individual interest. Now there is one notable and interesting exception to this, uh, perhaps if we consider some kind of land ethicky conservationist or ecologist, who um, does, in fact, engage in behavior precisely to bring about equilibrium or harmony or balance in the ecosystem. But even in that case, it's the actions of that individual that pursue that goal. It's not the actions of the ecosystem. Unless we think that the development of an ecological conscience in that person who's trying to bring about the harmony of the ecosystem is, in fact, part of the ecosystem, which is kind of something that Aldo Leopold does seem to be saying, so I, I don't know. Something definitely weird is going on there. It isn't even entirely clear, though, that ecosystems actually do trend towards stability and balance. They're remarkably dynamic, and at evolutionary scales, they seem to necessarily involve the extinction of some species and the generation of new species, things that are actually encouraged during selective pressures of ecological crises and instability. 
Mammals thrived and proliferated after the KT extinction only because the dinosaurs were wiped out. Was that in the biosphere's interests? Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? Is there such a thing as better or worse here, or is there only different? So perhaps ecosystems are like living organisms in some interesting and instructive ways, but it seems like they might be unlike living organisms in a crucial way that concerns moral considerability, namely goal-directedness. Now that isn't to say that ecosystems aren't valuable, nor is it to say that there's no support for the preservationist intuition that Kane claims to share with Leopold and others. Ecosystems are certainly valuable for extrinsic reasons by way of the intrinsic value of all of the individual creatures that live in an ecosystem. In a manner of speaking, we might say that the ecosystem has value, but perhaps this is only because the living organisms in it do. And this is similar to how the seemingly goal-directed behaviors of ecosystems might just be incidental byproducts of the goal-directed behaviors of individuals in those ecosystems. In both contexts, the appeal to individual organisms as the proper object of focus seems to explain and ground our naive intuitions a little bit better. Now, I'm honestly genuinely torn on this. Leopold's framework is appealing, and I believe that a shift towards the sort of ecological consciousness that he's talking about would be good, and maybe even necessary. I think I would even say that Aldo Leopold is an exemplar of ecological virtue. At the very least, I would maintain that the moral considerability of ecosystems is a valuable fiction. Perhaps the patriotic moral considerability of a political community works the same way. It's valuable and part of a natural evolutionary sequence that helps us navigate a world that we share with others. But maybe it's just a fiction. Maybe it's not grounded in reason. I would imagine that I'm not the only one who's torn on the moral considerability of ecosystems in this class. Some students even objected to the biocentric recognition of intrinsic goods and interests for plants back in our previous lesson on individualist biocentrism. For these folks, I would imagine that thinking about the interests of ecosystems is an even bigger ask. I'm not 100% sure if I'm on board with the idea myself, but I'm left wondering if this is just a limitation of my own moral imagination. I understand people who say that they have trouble taking the perspective of a tree and asking what is in the interest of the tree as a good of its own, not uh, as a mere means to human interests. But I think that these folks could learn to see from the perspective of a tree. And maybe the same goes for me and folks like Harley Cahan when it comes to seeing things from the perspective of the land, or as Aldo Leopold puts it, to think like a mountain. Now I think we've got a lot of questions to mull over here, and there were some really great ones that were worked out in the focus question discussion board. Here is my distilled version of those questions. Number one refers to some stuff that Leopold said about how slowly and ineffectively ecological education and conservation has been. Um, so this question asks, how can we teach conservation more aggressively? And there was another question that was close to this that we uh, I rolled them together to add this uh, secondary question to it. What role, if any, does philosophy have to play in this, uh, this plan to try to teach conservation more aggressively? Question number two seems to uh, be dealing with the ambiguity of the land ethic, and this is something that really is an issue. Perhaps it's due to Leopold's writing style, which is uh, a little bit more metaphorical and less precise than a lot of philosophers, but um, there do seem to be multiple different ways that one can interpret the land ethic. Um, are any of these ways coherent, and which of these multiple interpretations of the land ethic seems to be the most compelling and why? There were a whole bunch of questions that all seem to kind of be pointing in the same direction for question three, and uh, clearly it's a hodgepodge of lots of different folks who are getting at this question of what sorts of interventions or disruptions to the land are going to count as bad citizenship in the ecosystem, and what sorts are going to count as good citizenship according to a land ethical model. For example, is farming permissible? And that's probably going to depend on what kind of farming that we're talking about, so maybe we'll have to specify there. Is gardening permissible? Again, uh, that's probably going to depend on what kind, what style of gardening. Um, is it permissible to build a building for human use only? For example, a library. Is that part of good citizenship in the land? What about building a hydroelectric dam on a river? Is any project that impacts the land for anthropocentric gain only permissible? 
And question number four is one that I tossed into the mix. I think it's a pretty straightforward one. Um, is goal directedness an appropriate standard for moral considerability? And if we think that it is, do ecosystems exhibit this sort of goal directed behavior? As usual, I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say about this stuff, and I hope everybody's doing well.